Welcome back to the Compassionate Capitalist Show. Today, we're going to dig into an area that I think is um, really will come as a great relief to a lot of the investors that are listening and even really some of the entrepreneurs that are listening because almost everybody is invested in the stock market. It is just sort of what we've been conditioned since we, whether you had savvy parents or even in high school and you took a class where you had funny money that you, you did. We've all sort of been in this thing where we need to invest in the stock market. And uh, a lot of our 401ks are invested in the stock market. A lot of our retirement plans are invested in the stock market. And so it's really, um, it's really important to sort of understand the drivers of it. And if you're not that savvy understanding how the big market folks move their money and doing that, or you just kind of go by the, the recommendation of your wealth manager or something like that, um, you, you may have anxiety at uh, different times because you feel like you do all this stuff to predict a great stock and then circumstances completely beyond your, what seem beyond your control, take a, what would be a good stock company, you know, has all the right metrics and measurements and indicators and, you know, ratios and things like that. And, but it all of a sudden drops in value and, if you can, you know, if you have patience young enough, you wait and hold and it'll take a while to come back up. But it's a lot of times it's a real challenge for people and it creates anxiety. I talk about this all the time as part of my lead in as to why companies need to learn to invest in entrepreneurs as a diversification of a portfolio that is real estate and stocks. Because in that case, yes, there are some factors that affect their success, but in general, Everything, all effort and all money is going towards growing that company. And and so theoretically, they should be able to grow where they grow to and how you get an exit. That's a whole other conversation, not for now and stuff. So when my guest today, Andrew Einhorn, was uh, re reached out to me um, and we're, we had a history, we have a history. I'll talk about that in just a second because of his new company, Level Fields. Uh, it is a, I was like, wow, this is really interesting and very timely and something that I have a personal interest in because of courses I took way back when, um, before there was a lot of technology to look at the stock market and predict things in the stock market. I had looked at this stuff and I was like, wow, this is really amazing that he's doing this. And it is so relatable because I've seen other much more complex models that aren't near as functional and effective as you are. And that's sort of the advancement of technology. So Level Fields is an AI-driven fintech application that automates arduous investment researcher so investors can find opportunities faster and easier. Andrew's mission as the co-founder and CEO of this is to create AI tools that make advanced financial strategies effortless and accessible for all. Sounds like a compassionate capitalist movement thing, doesn't it? So, um, so I'm gonna, for those that are watching, hello, Andrew, say hello and welcome. I'm going to talk some more, but I want people to know that you're you're sitting standing by. No, I'm here. Thanks, Karen. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. So great. So, so we are, um, our common ground is driven to level the playing field for investors that want to create wealth with through being simple transparent professional grade he has a powerful ai technology tool through level fields the company that's accessible and affordable so that every investor can realize a vision for financial security my, in my case the jobs act crowdfunding act leveled the playing field for middle class uh young people people that aren't yet accredited making you know hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and millions of dollars in assets can also play, have a level playing field to participate in entrepreneurs through what we would call uh, Reg CF or any of the crowdfunding direct public offerings. Completely different, right? They're completely different, but we do, Andrew and I share this common ground of helping, empowering the individual investor to be better equipped at making financial decisions so that they have a greater odds of growing their wealth and reduce their anxiety over, uh, you know, over not feeling in control of what happens with the their precious dollars that they're investing. And I, so for you, my listening audience, 
Stay tuned. We're going to talk a lot more about the inspiration behind Level Fields. We're going to talk all about you know, how that pulls together, best practices. He has an extensive background now as an angel investor. So he sat on all the sides of the table <laughs> and you're going to learn a great deal about that, all of his experiences in that, that I think you'll be able to walk away from this podcast, learning about how to make, if you're an entrepreneur, how to make your business more successful. When it, when is, we're going to talk about that in just a second. When is the right time to pivot and exit? If you are a stock market investor, you're going to be able to learn about a new tool that will help you in making those decisions so you're not subject to the edicts and corporate directives of the your financial planners and, and wealth managers. And for those that are looking at becoming a, an angel investor, you're going to learn about some from somebody that literally has invested in a lot of companies in a short period of time has a very specific way that he goes about it but also had has experienced some very positive returns on those investments so with that everybody should be properly curiosity you know all that good stuff so they're staying tuned um i want to bring andrew in to talk about that experience of how he built his first company and pivoted to an exit because that is when we first met. He was, um, when he came in on, on this, I looked up his name and he had a different domain name and that was, Oh my gov, which became synoptos. Uh, and he made a pivot there. And I think the story behind that is really good. So I'm going to let him tell that because I think that's the first step to understanding. And then we'll get into how he, why he started Level Fields and what he what he took from that first experience to go about doing uh, what he what he has done and built with this AI driven technology. So with that, Andrew, um, <laughs> talk about what Oh My Gov was. What was your experience in building that? Because you you made your decision to pivot pretty close in and made your exit in what some you know a lifespan that some people you know um, would be really impressed with, right? Because <laughs> uh, it's five years, I guess, from when you started it to when you sold it. So. Uh, and, you know, and just explain, you know, sort of how you had that aha moment and then what you did to build it to the point of being able to successfully sell it. Sure. Thank you. Happy to happy to talk through that. It was a journey for sure. Um, so I guess on background, I would say, you know, I was doing management consulting for federal agencies, mostly through a, a company that went public around that time called ICF International. And I was a, a senior consultant there. And we were building some infrastructure for the Department of Defense on a contract. So we're building a software system that uh, monitored environmental and safety threats and different um, events effectively across all the different continents that uh, you know military members and their families experienced on bases uh, all around the world. And it was a really complicated, really challenging build out technological. And I sort of fell in love with the process of, of building of you know software architecture and, and creation and watching kind of ideas come to life and so that that was sort of the initial hook into tech for me at the same time you know i was working in um, largely military facilities and government offices and buildings doing a lot of different consulting gigs sometimes we were at nasa sometimes you know faa was in the early stages of uh, allowing commercial space transportation and this was like early days of, uh, of of horizontal launch and things like that that SpaceX okay. went into. Okay. Um, around that time, you know, we'd kind of get together for, for lunch with a few of my colleagues and we'd just make kind of jokes about the, the craziness that we saw inside government, right? So what was going wrong and all the kind of silly things that you might see in a sitcom, like a space force, right, based on government. And so we had this idea, let's put up a blog about all the, the crazy stuff that we saw. Let's call it, oh my gov, you know, kind of satirical, and then talk about it. And so we we launched this blog really as a, a side, kind of a joke, and it took off. <laughs> we started seeing a lot of traction, you know, 50, 100,000 visitors a month were coming through it. And we said, all right, so this is interesting and it's working. What are we going to do with it now? Uh, maybe instead of just pointing out all the flaws, let's Let's build some solutions. And so the first idea that we had was, you know, government often operates in a vacuum. You know, you have 
whether it's a two-star general that comes in or an SDS that gets appointed, they come in and they say, this is what we're going to do. There's no polling of what citizens want. You know, there's no polling of what the employees want. They just kind of do it. And so around that time, you know, social media was really becoming a thing, right? Facebook, Twitter, everybody was going on social media, expressing their views. And so our, our idea was, can we go out, aggregate this information through data mining and analyze what people actually want their government agencies to be doing, and then feed that back into the agency as sort of a real-time polling measure, right? And we built a tool to do that. We had a few early adopters in government agencies that were using it, but it just wasn't fast enough. You know, we found that the agency procurement process was slow, that, you know, there, if there wasn't a requirement to build it or to use it, it was very difficult to sell them the idea. And so the ongoing joke was we could have the cure for cancer in our hand, but if there was no government requirement to buy that cure for cancer, yeah. nobody gets the cancer cure. Right. So it's like, OK, we're uh, we pounded on a lot of doors, uh, made a lot of contacts. We had a lot of people nod and say, yeah, this would be great if only I had a budget for it, if only somebody could see past it. And so made a little bit of money at that point, enough to kind of keep building. And we started to talk to folks in the private sector, particularly like the lobbying industry. And they were really interested, not about what people thought of government, but what the government was doing. So they're saying, you know, with our system, we were actually monitoring what the government was doing and what they were communicating across all their social platforms. And so we we pivoted and said, you know what, instead of aggregating information from what the citizens were saying about the government, let's look at what the government is saying in aggregate and identify some trends. And that allowed kind of lobbyists and business development professionals to get an edge about what they should be selling into the government or what kind of um, you know, policies they need to be convincing the government to move off of. And so they'd see things like, well, you know, all of a sudden the government is pushing this like equality piece, for example. And so now they have a re equality legislation that they think that they could put in through the federal, you know, agencies before going into Congress. And likewise, you had some, you know, big consulting companies going, well, what do they really want to buy? Because we could sell them anything, right? Let's find out what they can buy. And so that was, that was kind of the essence of our first pivot. We saw, okay, okay, let's turn the looking glass around, not at <clears throat> and see what government is saying and analyze that and give it to uh, businesses as, as part of business intelligence software. And then as we began to expand, we saw different use cases for tracking the information in real time that we now had in our database. For instance, you know, if something happened in the in then it was it was notified on Twitter. Uh, that somebody posted, we could grab that and in real time send it to a business so they were aware of it. And this was at the beginning of media monitoring. And this was, I think, when we met, when I started really pitching for for dollars for the business and said, you know, this, this media monitoring thing is going to be huge. It's going to blow up. This is going to be an $8 billion industry. I can't tell you how many people laugh me off the stage <laughs> when I said that. They're like, nobody cares. The social media thing will be gone in five years. No way. What, what year was this? This was about 2011, 2012. Okay. This was That's still when like funny. Twitter was posting the fail whale, you know, and it was down all the time because of too much yeah. use. And Facebook was, you know, becoming pervasive everywhere. But the belief on the investor community was <laughs> this was just social noise. The belief was that people were just posting about breakfast and what they did yesterday at the gym <laughs> and any real information. And, you know, I called BS on all of it and uh, yeah. as did the rest of the team. And so, you know, what ended up happening obviously was we were right. <laughs> they were wrong. Yeah. It's not an $8 billion industry. It's now a $10 billion industry. And we were pretty early into it. Yeah. And just because MySpace, I had to jump in here, but just because MySpace failed, right. <laughs> even after sponsoring American Idol, that right. isn't an indicator of everybody else. It's all about business model and who, who it actually engages and them pivoting. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep, uh, exactly. Bravo. And ben Spencer went away as well. <laughs> oh, I, don't even, I never even got on that one. So there you go. No. <laughs> Google Plus, you know, came and went before anyone really used it. Um, yes. 
So, yeah, but some of them obviously stuck. And what we found, and this was around 2013, is we started seeing, you know, opportunities to do this sort of real-time analysis and then give reports to businesses, usually large corporations that were publicly traded and could charge for those reports or for the real-time data. And we were a young company you know, we were all tech and we had like no services. And so a lot of the clients that we were bringing on for the platform, they kept saying the same thing to us. Hey, I love what you guys are doing, but I don't have time to go on your platform. Can you just send it to us like with a little written note or can you create a little report out of this once a week and I can take it into my boss. And so we started doing that experimentally you would say, yeah, sure, of course, you know, our staff could do this, which meant like I was going in doing it myself, you know, trying to put together these reports and then saying, here's what the staff came up with. Um, and, you know, the client didn't know the difference. and It was good information. But at some point we grew too big and we're like, we really need people like people who know how to do this stuff. And so we're at a conference and it just became, um, you know, kind of a little bit luck that we, we met another company that was sort of the exact opposite of us. They had been around for 15 years. They were all services and no tech. And they were doing the same thing, but they were doing it manually with like spreadsheets and Google searches. And so we met, it was kind of like, oh, here's yin and yang. Like we're the tech that can streamline you into the next, you know, 10 years. They're the service team that's already trained. This seems to be a perfect fit. And so we ended up doing an acquisition of that company and then we merged and became a new entity called Synoptos. So the, what the merger did for us, uh, it gave us the staff that was trained, but also came with a lot of large clients, big name clients, you know, it's like Lockheed Martin and Discover Card, you know, blue chip clients. And once we had the blue chip logos, it was much easier to convince other blue chip companies that they could trust us, that we had been around long enough Suddenly, we we were we didn't have a history of three years or two years. We had a history of fifteen years, and that gave a lot of people people more confidence to you know to go through the procurement process. And as we kind of layered the tech and showed off the tech with the services, it became kind of really this wow, much bigger, more interesting operation uh, that was both you know kind of trendy in terms of cutting edge technology, but also had the understanding of their industry and their business to really put reports in front of them that made them look great to their boss. And that was kind of our, our internal guiding principle was we told all our staff, your job is to make your client look like a hero to their boss, because if they get promoted, they're going to keep taking us everywhere they go. And that was a big part of our marketing strategy was just make them look good to their boss. Listen when they have their bosses meeting with their bosses or their quarterly or their annual strategic meeting, hone in on that and proactively give them everything they can to make them the smartest person in the room that day. And they'll bring us everywhere. And so we had a bunch of these clients that would, you know, they would change jobs every two years. So we had one client that brought us into five different, you know, publicly traded large cap companies. And so, you know, that was a big part of the, the marketing plan was just, you know, treat your existing customers uh, totally VIP, right? And so we, from 2014 to 2019, we grew the company rapidly. We took down our costs substantially. So the gross margin, for example, when we did, you know, the acquisition of the company, of the company that we acquired was about 40, 45% gross margin. By the time we sold the company, our gross margin was 80%. And that's because and it was subscription services, right? So you did- just... You didn't, you didn't let your cost of goods compared to your, as your revenue grew, got lower and lower and lower. Cause it's, it's, it's kind of baseline across everybody. You know, it's not right. I mean, that's the way. Well, we software. took it. It was software, but remember we were doing services and software. So it was sort of tech enabled services. And so we started, it was a lot of manual effort, a lot of like, you know, spreadsheet work and. Right. And right. And then you automated that with software that did that. Right. And then we started automating all that work and still there was a human kind of pushing levers, but they had to push fewer and fewer buttons over time. And so we changed that trajectory, you know, from kind of a services narrative to, hey, this really is a tech company. Look at those margins. Yeah. 
uh, and that's where we're acquired ultimately in, in 2019 as a tech company. Yeah. So let me see if I can synopsis this for synopsis on the synoptos for the uh, listeners. So because you had identified that there within the government, there were these these trigger events. This was what the reason was for, oh, my God, there's things that had happened. But there wasn't a home, a need, a fundamental need for somebody willing to pay for it until, you know, it was something, you know, really bad, right? They, there wasn't as much of a customer base there, but you realize the 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 process, the value of the data to commercial customers was tremendous because they needed to make sure they maintained good brand quality. They needed to maintain good customer relationships, they needed to be ahead of any kind of PR incident. You know, I think you had like, you know, had given me an example of um, like CSX or, you know, a petroleum company like Exxon, when there's a disaster that happens that you can pick up in real time monitoring from news things because you're monitoring social media. And, tr and sometimes Twitter, a lot of times is like the immediate place where it's real time on the street reporting of stuff. You could then capitalize that and feed it to your commercial customers, which they found extremely valuable because they could do a plan. And then it also became something within that individually people realized that this tool would help them in their careers. And that had, so it was finding that the pivot was really finding where the point of pain was and he was willing to pay for it. That's right. Yeah. We, our first pivot was really looking at, you know, turning the government data that we had into into something that we could monetize, right? And a, a concrete example was there's a chemical called PFAS, P-F-A-S, which is now kind of widely known, but they, they put it in um, fire retardants. So if you're spraying, you know, on a base, if there's a fire that breaks out, you spray it. And so what the government was starting to do these investigations on the bases that were revealing that PFAS was actually harmful for human health. And so those studies, because the government was doing internal studies and posting them on kind of government websites, we would grab that information. We saw patterns. Navy was doing this. Army was doing this. Coast Guard started to do it. Right. And so that information we could then go and send to uh, a regulated entity that was on those military bases who might have been the contractor, like a general dynamics and said, look what the regulation coming. Like, this is how it starts. It starts with research and some reg regulation and fines. Or we send it to, you know, a big oil company and say, hey, if they're going to regulate, self-regulate on the military basis, you better believe they're going to regulate your rigs with this stuff. And, you know, that became kind of very, um, I wouldn't say lucrative, but, you know, we, we could charge a good amount for that type of information, which was difficult to get and aggregate as, as business intelligence. So that was really kind of the, yeah. the moment of pivot. And then look at working towards greater efficiency to grow your margins and your revenue so that you became an irresistible target for acquisition for a company who acquired Synoptos. Uh, it was a large private equity firm, mm. and there were okay. you know the multiple brands within it. So the the immediate brand that bought us was called Ignite, Ignite Technologies, and so their business model was um, just buy really good companies, solid companies, and take their clients, and then cross market to all of their clients, all the other companies that they bought. Okay. Yeah. So they would buy in like a vertical, for example, and um, they would say, all right, we, we've got, you know, we have all these clients who are, uh, you know, in, in blue chip companies, we want to get a solution for HR, a solution for accounting, a solution for comms, a solution for marketing, a solution for BD. Let's go and find companies within each area that have a solution. And then as they aggregate their clients, they can say, hey, we have one client in, I don't know, you know, Visa, but Visas can buy 20 different solutions from us. Yeah. Know, all in the same contract. Which is a common practice for private equity funds and hedge funds when they do right. 
those kind of roll ups and aggregates. So, um, so what made you decide? What was the trigger event? Was it just burnout from working crazy and the first company that like they made you an offer you couldn't refuse, or did you make a decision now it's time to sell? So we're going to start courting different acquirers to see who we can get the best deal from. Talk a little bit about the decision and time frame of when. Mm -hmm you decided that it was time to sell and exit that business. So it was like late 2018. Uh, we, we started looking for growth equity capital. We were in that kind of later stage and we met with this private equity firm and they loved the business. And they also had another business that they really loved. And they said, you know, I think you guys are the platform company and this other company. If we, merge you together will be like a super entity. And the other company was an AI company. And they did some interesting things with narrative analysis uh, for largely for military and by narrative, you know, you could kind of analyze like prevailing viewpoints that were very pervasive and kind of sticky. Um, and so they really wanted to, to put us together. So we were trying to put together like a $15 million deal where we would get enough capital to buy them out and then enough capital to, you know, expand. And as we started looking at the numbers, you know, went back to the board and the board was like, okay, I can see this, you know, five, six years out, but looking at the dilution, what would it look like if we just sold the company today? And then I was like, all right, I got work to do. So I had to go find and figure out, you know, were there buyers uh, for the company as it was today, we found a buyer. And we kind of compared the deals and we said, well, ultimately, if you kind of do discounted cash flow and take out and take on take into account some of the risks associated with having a company longer, it was actually a better deal to sell the company than it was to do this big growth equity deal that they perceived as higher risk with the understanding that my view at the time was that we were we were headed towards a recession. And I kind of had advised the board. I'm like, my view is we're headed towards a brick wall. You know, I can kind of see it like the market's getting overheated. Like we're, we're, we're long overdue. We've been on cheap money for a long time. Yeah. And if the recession happens, some of our clients are really cyclical businesses. They're going to be heavily impacted. Okay. Yep, that's true. And that was your own analysis, knowing that, because knowing what you, which kind of leads into level fields, because you, you anticipating, you know, right. trigger events and things like that, right? So did you get, had you gotten some outside counsel from M&A firms to, this is the best thing and, and sort of shop it and help you with some of the financials or did you do all that in-house? We did both. Uh, we actually, I hired a, a firm to try to sell the company. Uh, to sort of give me a hand to just get some idea about our, our worth in the market. Uh, I ended up firing them because they were pretty lazy. You know, they sent a bunch of emails and they said, you know, we're working on it. And then I looked, I'm like, okay, you know, this isn't really work. I could, I could do this in a day, what you're doing and you're going to charge me 6%. No, thanks. Um, so I fired them and just took it over and started shopping the deal myself. Ended up finding, you know, the, the PE firm that ultimately bought us that way. And then on the other side, you know, some of the M&A folks that we had talked to, we did get some advice from them. Everybody wanted a piece of the pie. Of course, they were pushing towards the larger deal because they could lay claim to it, but it was already on the table, meaning, you know, we had already gotten this offer. And so we just kind of compared and contrasted. And, and you know, also in the back of my head was this other idea and I've been, we've been doing this business now for uh, running it for about seven, seven and a half years. And then prior to that, trying to capitalize it for two. So we were tired, I think, of the idea and the business. And, and frankly, I think some of the staff just wanted a break from each other um, after many years of working together and kind of dealing with everyone's idiosyncrasies. It so always has fires to put out, right? Startups and early stage companies, even if you get to millions of revenue, seems like there's always a fire to put out. There was always something, you know, when you're running a business, there's always something that goes wrong. I don't care how good yeah. the business is. And you just have to realize that's going to happen. And one day, you know, I, I could make a long list from, you know, our clients 
uh, dying unexpectedly to uh, hostile takeovers to, uh, you know, weird fires breaking out at facilities and then having to wake up in the middle of the night to help the client um, to political hostilities from the Trump administration. And, you know, and then it goes on and on and on. Um, it was a wild ride with a lot of stories. <laughs> it was fun, but we were tired towards the end. And we had this uh, advisor on our advisory board who was sort of whispering for years, like, you guys are in the wrong industry. You know, I love what you do, but you're completely in the wrong business. You should be in financial services. Like, if you do this in financial services, you'll make 10 times more. And, you know, we, he had me come over and serve as an advisor to this hedge fund where he was a portfolio manager. And I was watching, you know, how the hedge fund operated and, you know, literally standing in their headquarters in London and talking to different traders and trying to understand like how they went and do things. And we, we thought about that, like, okay, I could see how our advantage of gathering information quickly and giving it to people would give you an advantage if you're investing or trading, but we were just not capitalized or in a place in terms of our business evolution where we could just stop everything and then completely shift to financial services, which would take years to build up again. So the idea was sort of seated in my head and kind of always swirling around the back of my head, like, well, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe it was a better, better model there. We were helping very, very large corporations save billions of dollars a year. And we were getting paid nicely, but we were getting paid, you know, 50, hundred thousand dollar year contracts. So that was always kind of there. Um, and then, you know, the, yeah. the world changed from, yeah. from the COVID, we, right. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so you, so you, you sold just before all chaos and, you know, craziness and the world mm -hmm. sort of ended and we all sort of collectively lost a year of our lives, you know, wondering what was next. Uh, so during that time you regrouped, you, you know, took some time off and, you know, what, so did you, were you con thinking about this the whole time or did you truly step back? And then it was when you came out of it uh, in 2021, cause you, cause you didn't start level fields until just last year. Right. So. No. So we, we sold the company in early 2019. It was March, 2019. And then we had to sign contracts to stay on for three months to help with the transition, which we did. Uh, and then we left and the, the whole process from eminent, you know, for the acquisition process and the stress of it with a company of that size was high. Uh, you know, you just think about magnitude, right? So we were, we were about a 55 person company when we sold, um, you know, we were in a few countries, different offices, but we were, we were still only about 55 people. They were coming in with hundreds, if not thousands. And so their deal team was like 40 people. <laughs> our deal team was me and my accountant <laughs> and our lawyer. <laughs> and it was just, we were just swamped in paperwork and, you know, due diligence requests. And many of this stuff, you know, was, there were documents that only I knew where they existed you know, or, or, or one or two people knew where they existed. So just fielding those requests in the timely manner, you know, going back and forth on kind of legal arguments, what should the contract say and which staff. And I, I tried really hard to make sure the staff wasn't going to be fired on day one when they took over the acquisitions. We build those types of things into the contracts, but it takes a lot of fighting and arguing over, you know, everything. So at that point, they were already tired to get this deal through, which took... I remember, I think the offer came in, it was Thanksgiving and the acquisition actually got completed like March. So it took a while <clears throat> and everybody was pretty tired. And then we had to help with the transition and we thought, oh, okay, we'll just sit back and, you know, kind of put on our advisor hats and answer questions as they came up. But they had a very thorough kind of fast moving process for onboarding. And so it was just that pace just kept, kept going. And so after six months, everybody was pretty burned out. You know, we all needed a break. And so, the you know, financial services was the farthest thing 
from my mind. The only thing I could think about was like a warm beach and a margarita. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, you know, we took, we took some time off. I, I took about, I don't know what it was. My wife was calling it a sabbatical. It was about five months, I suppose. And just kind of researched whatever I wanted to research, you know, lost the weight that I had put on <laughs> during the six months of tribulations and, and late night, you know, takeout food. Um, and then, you know, this, our CTO from, from the previous company said, Hey, I've been working on this thing. I was waiting for you to see if, uh, you know, if you're done being tired and you're ready to work again. <laughs> <laughs> and he had taken the, the technical staff. So we did, we sold the company, but we kept all the technical staff from the previous company. And they had been kind of tinkering with some of the ideas that we had had, you know, over that five month period. And we said, well, let me see what you're up to. And they're like, well, we're kind of doing this AI thing, you know, leveraging the stuff that we were doing before, but better. Um, similar to you know some of the things the company were were going to acquire but didn't was working on and then taking that to the next level and so the, the broad concept was can we create self populating databases right a database that you wouldn't have to enter data into that an AI system could just fill the forms and then the data would populate and then we were looking at well what do we do with that do we create kind of a way to make your own business from that or is there a certain type of data that we want to populate? And we analyzed a few different markets, including law it was actually one of the first ones we were looking at. We had this idea of like, well, maybe we could do like personal injury cases where, you know, the AI could kind of vet the case on behalf of the attorney. So the attorney wouldn't get all these inbound emails that they would then ultimately turn down anyway. And, you know, we polled, I don't know, like a thousand different lawyers to see how much would they pay and does this sound viable? And didn't really pan out, you know, on the business model. And so we started, you know, at the time I was also just analyzing markets and, and events anyway, and kind of playing around with that, that broad concept. Uh, and then COVID hit in February, 2020, markets started selling off like crazy. Everybody was panicking. We all thought, you know, there was a depression coming and we're getting lots of calls from family members who are losing their retirements and their tuition savings for their kids and, you know, freaking out. Uh, and there was a large debate over how long this would this would go on. And so, you know, I went in and I started to do some research because I was still on my sabbatical, really. I was one of the few, <laughs> I had a lot of free time. And I could. So I spent about 80 hours researching like every pandemic that's ever hit, how the markets reacted, how the governments reacted. And I came out and I said, you know, we're going to be fine in six months. The market's going to be right back to where we left off in January. And yeah, I got called a lot of names for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, ultimately, they came to be true because you could see the patterns and, you know, smaller, but 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 similar pandemics and epidemics like Zika. Uh, and it was that moment that, you know, sort of looked at how long that took, it was 80 hours to get an answer like that, that we realized like, okay, here's what we do with the AI. We need to monitor events and we need to figure out what's going to happen because of that event. It shouldn't because take of past predictability because you can see what happened when similar events have happened in the past. That's right. Because we're humans and humans form the stock market and humans follow patterns in our behavior, how we react to things, how we think about things. And so an event is really just a marker where human behavior begins. And then you can see that past history of reactions. And so we, we start with the idea of COVID and thought, well, okay, it doesn't happen that often, but there were markers that could have said, get out of the airline industry stocks. Don't buy a cruise stock, right? Those are the ones that tanked first. If you actually look at the sell-off on the first day that uh, Zika transmission in the United States was announced, cruise ships sold off 6.5%. The first day COVID transmission happened in the United States, cruise ship stocks sold off 6.5%. Hmm. Same exact pattern. 
Same thing happened with the airlines, about 12% for those. And so what you realize is like, you know, professional investors are following these playbooks because they already know them, but the average investor has no idea about this stuff. You know, for us, it's kind of a mystery, right? It's just like randomness. And some days the stocks are up, some days down, you don't really know why. And so when we pushed on this idea of analyzing events to determine what's going to happen next, what we realized was almost every price movement in the market is because of an event. And so if we can categorically understand all those events, then we know why the stock is moving and we know how it's going to move, what direction. And we also can see, you know, with statistics, how far in that direction is going to move. You know, Jeff Bezos walks out of Amazon. Everyone knows people are going to sell the stock. We don't know how much of it they're going to sell or for how long they're going to sell. You know, so intuitively, you know, it's going down, but you don't know if, by how much and for how long. And that's what a lot of our platform now answers because it looks at every single time a CEO departs across different categories of similar companies like large cap tech, we can see, hey, typically there's a 2% dip on day one, a 1% dip on day two. It kind of mucks around in the middle and then two months later, it's actually back to where it began. So this is actually a buying opportunity. And you can see that right on the platform. And it yeah. doesn't take any real training to see that because it's the statistic is right there. Just like you would look at, you know, a weather report and say, well, what are the chances of rain and how long is it going to rain for? Okay, by four o'clock, we should be good to go, you know, to the beach or whatever. Um, it's the same thing, you know, with, with the market. So, you know, we, we we set out to really kind of push on that and say, we, we need to make this easier for people because unless you've worked on Wall Street for 20 years, you don't understand all of these market dynamics that are pulling all the time or how people in the market are going to react when these events occur. And it becomes physically impossible to monitor the quantity of events that occur, which we're monitoring 21 million a year. Mm. Oh, yeah. Without AI. Yeah. Yeah. So you built the underlying engine that does the population of database. And then from that, other algorithms can analyze and predict and come out, like spit out a here's what I mean, is it all pretty much automated once those databases are are populated for you to provide to your subscribers? That yeah. this is what they mm -hmm. they will what what's going to happen with they can put can they put in like their whole portfolio and it monitors their specific industry and sector and type of thing based on big events or do they put in certain things and have to analyze it for themselves or how turnkey is it for your subscribers? It works both ways. So you could start with um, your portfolio and say I'm going to create a watch list and I'm interested when very significant events happen to those stock holdings, just send me an alert and you can set the specific type of event, or you can just say anything that goes through the platform. That's, you know, we, we, we look at the material movers, anything that goes to the platform, let me know. And so if you hold Amazon and, and Bezos retires, you'll know, you know, from the company announcement within probably 30 minutes that he retires. And then you could go and look at an analysis of what normally happens when CEOs depart their organizations. And on the system, it will show, it's like this, it has like an icon of a, an angry bear in red. <laughs> so it's it's bearish. And it was a minus 2% day one move. And so, you know, okay, it's going to drop 2% today, you know, and then you can look at an array of data based on previous events and say, well, here's what happens on day two, day three, day four, a week later, two months later. Yeah. So you're looking back at kind of historical patterns and then can can take it from there and the other side is if you want to find opportunities you can think of it kind of like a kayak.com or expedia.com for events that move share prices and you can okay. go shop and you come so, in and say i want to make five percent today what's going on in the market oh wow well, so, yeah so that so in that case where you might panic on your amazon stock because there is such a seismic announcement you would know, okay, it's going to go down two, three, four percent when it when it traditionally has hit the the bottom because they 
you know, haven't announced. And so it's a week out, let's just say hypothetically, that's when it becomes a buy opportunity. You still have your old stock. So you're not panicking, selling it. You go in and you go like, I'm going to buy more because it's now it's down and it's going to go back up because that's what history has done. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then also yeah. with whatever new thing that might be coming, like, I mean, I would bet it really interesting. It would be interesting to have seen with all this turmoil that's been going on in the with the AI leadership and open AI and he's resigning, he's fired, the board firing. No, all the employees <laughs> are going to quit and they're right. like back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Right. That's never been like that's a pretty unpredictable sort of event to have mm -hmm. individuals so influenced in something that is kind of open source. So it's like, who's, but there's a lot, you know, riding on the, on what happens with AI and the ethics of how that does. And, and for the listening audience, the AI they're talking that we use right now, where it creates content for something is just one level. Like the artificial intelligence that level field uses is computers analyzing and doing stuff that's based on actual data. And it's been, AI has been used within that kind of function. It does it in traffic control systems. It does it in all kinds of things behind the scenes that you have completely taken for granted because it's just been funneling, doing things behind the scenes that make like easier for the rest of us. Okay, so just want to do that sort of initial disclaimer on this because now AI sort of come, has come into the radar and people, they don't know if AI is good or bad and it makes them all nervous. <laughs> and in this right. case, you know, understand, predicting to where they do that in weather. I mean, everything you think about weather patterns, how they predict weather patterns and forecast is all AI driven behind the scenes pretty much now, you know, other than, and then walking outside and going, well, you know, hmm, I think I'll put my finger up in the air and I think it's going to rain and uh, you know, tomorrow <laughs> but anyway so i i want the, the everybody i know you're really curious level fields l-e-v-e-l-f-e-i-l-d-s and is it a dot com or a dot ai or both dot uh, ai level fields dot ai okay and what can people there because i i went there there's some great information about what you're doing your mission and your purpose is there is there a way for them to try it out to sort of see examples of how it works or anything like that yeah, we have a bunch of videos on the website, uh, so you can watch some of those. We have additional ones in our YouTube channel. Um, there are alerts. You can sign up for our newsletter for free. You could sign up for a free trial. We send you know an AI-driven alert uh, per week, or you could use promo code PODCAST23 if you want a discount and sign up. It's pretty cheap in terms of cost and what we're doing. Ends up being about 63 cents a day to have, you know, real-time monitoring that's customizable through AI of 6,300 stocks in the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange. Yeah. So that promo code was podcast 23? That's right. Okay. Podcast all right. That'll be in the show notes too, in case y'all didn't write it down right away. So, um, all right. So, you know, in the time that we have left, because it's really fascinating, I think when we talked before and we were doing our catch-up call, You've invested in 50 companies as an angel investor or a private investor. Did you start that while you were building this other company or in your months after you had your exit? Or has it just been sort of something all along? Talk about how you became aware of the ability to do that and sort of your what you've learned as being your best practices for um, identifying and investing in private companies and entrepreneurs that are seeking capital. Sure. Yeah. Happy to help. Um, yeah. Outside of my own companies, I've invested in, in 50 companies. Uh, if you count my own, there's 53. And yes, it all came about after I exited uh, Synoptos. Once we sold, there were some conversations with me potentially running uh, other startups that came to me and said, hey, we need a we need a captain. What do you think? And, you know, started those conversations. So I got into the space and really enjoyed it. Sometimes I was just taking phone calls because I had time. I said, well, this is this is how I would advise you to do this or you know, think about this structure for your contract or your cap table. And I liked it. Um, and so I, I sought more of that. And at the time, what I started to see was, you know, some of these kind of a later stage 
um, stock offering sites like an equity Zen and, and a few others like that, where they would take the equity of employees at companies that were pre IPO, but like series D series E level funding. And then you could buy them directly from the employees through these business brokers. And so the first one I bought was lemonade stock, uh, liked, liked the market, understood the business model. And I think having been an operator and entrepreneur, you kind of know what the challenges are of kind of growing a company. And I liked the strategy they had, which was, you know, cheap contracts for rental insurance. And then it's sticky. You treat, just treat the client really well. And when they go and buy a house, you know, your $50 a month contract becomes a $200 a month insurance contract. And you expand that way without having to do a lot of customer acquisition costs. So I put some money in uh, and then about, I want to say eight, maybe 12 months later, it wasn't long. They actually IPO'd and they IPO'd at twice the price that I paid. Uh, and then they went on to 4X what I had initially put in, which I, at that point, I was like, well, it's just too much too fast. <laughs> it was like, it was, it was worth double. It wasn't worth 4X. And so I think the price hit. I want to say it was, you know, hundred and somewhat dollars a share, $150 a share. And I just, I, I sold out the position, um, but I sold out with a 4X return. I was like, well, that was fun. Let's do that. Again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, that's a great way. I, I advise people that are getting, when you're building, I call it the angel profitability blueprint, but diversity, 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 diversity in stage, diversity in industry, invest in things, you know, just like Warren Buffett says, and, you know, divest in the different types of structure. And that's how you create a portfolio that will do the industry standard of 3x what, you know, traditional stocks and real estate do. So that's really terrific that you knew that you had the ability to to buy from employees through platforms like that, because there's a, a few of them now. So I'm, were, I, yeah. I'm glad to hear that that was your, to me, that's as, uh, you have to have a higher level. You have to be accredited. You have to be able to put a lot more money in than you would like in a mm -hmm. reg CF or some of these other, other platforms that, but the, so the amount of money is higher, but the relative risk of a lower money, like losing $500 and right. learning about it versus, you know, maybe $50,000, but you know that this company has already been established. They already have success. They already know how to make money. And, you know, the opportunity is still the basic premise of angel investing. They're, they're taking money and growing it. They're still working. They're all, all the entrepreneurs are working to achieve a higher exit. So right. that's, um, uh, it is a, in that particular model, sort of a hybrid because you're buying from employees, just like stock market, you're buying from another person, but the odds of it going up multi double, much less 4X are pretty low when it's a straight up public stock. It's hard to move the needle there. So yeah, I mean, it, for that. And so what it, other kind of investments have you made with private companies? So, you know, at that time I knew the IPO market was, was just on fire. So, you know, I was looking around for more like that. Um, found a lot of overpriced companies that I wasn't really comfortable putting large chunks of money in. So then I started looking at, you know, alternatives and, and found some of these sort of uh, like venture capital vehicles, syndicates that you could join and you, know, you sort of apply to join and get, you know, approved. And then they give you some deal flow from that. And so that's where the bulk of them came from. And so just, you know, understanding on like a portfolio management basis, I was looking at it and saying, okay, you know, we had an exit, so I have to allocate capital and sit in cash. Uh, what can we do with money? Right. We had, some core positions and 401k stuff, you know, we buy some stocks some blue chip stuff. We bought, you know, some next like, smaller biotech, you know, growth stocks that was, was going into a little bit of crypto, not a ton at the time, just to really kind of understand it. Uh, and then this other piece was saying, well, if we can take, you know, a percentage of the portfolio, five, 10% allocated towards startups. And then within that five, 10%, let's look at different stages. And so one of the companies that I invested in was uh, AngelList, which has a lot of the deal flow through the platform itself. 
to host this because what I saw them doing, and I still see them doing, which I think is going to be astronomical in a few years, is the deals to finance the company are going through AngelList. And when they see the best deals that they're looking and they're using AI to identify the best deals based on like statistical probability of the outcomes of the investors themselves, stage of the company, founders, and all of that, they put money from AngelList corporate right into the company that's going through the platform. It's almost like you know, they get to choose like the best deals that go through and put a little bit, a little bit, a little bit money into it and seed and water these, you know, entities. And so 10 years later, the company, the corporate structure of AngelList might be worth, you know, 50x as those other investments start to blossom. And so that was one where I was like, oh, this is kind of a no-brainer to me. Put some money into that. But then, you know, looking at it from stage perspective, I felt like my expertise was in sort of, you know, pre-seed to series A is where I've spent most of the time. Is where I know operationally um, the greatest risks and reward exists. And I kind of can spot a company that has made it past the threshold of really proving product market fit. And the ones that are really just saying that they are, but they're just yeah. spending a lot of money on acquisition. Um, I feel like I, I have a good knack for spotting that. And then also looking at the macro view and saying, okay, you know, what are the big corporations going to do? Are they going to do this anyway? And then eat these companies for lunch if a Microsoft decides to do this? Or is this a good pickup for an acquisition? Because they're not going to pay attention to it for the next five years until the company's worth a hundred million and then they'll buy it. Some things of that nature that, you know, sort of look at and say, you know, is this going to be an, and, and some of the companies that were coming through, it was like a Thracio, you know, Amazon roll-ups type companies that I would see and say, I don't get it. Like, like, why do these companies need to exist when Amazon, Amazon exists and they just look like they were just buying other companies to like increase the valuation. To me, it just like, we work part two. You know, we're like, keep growing top line. Don't worry about bottom line yeah. until you eventually go bankrupt, uh, which just happened. And, you know, again, <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah. so, so you look at those, like, I don't know. I, I always look for the ones that have struggled, like a company that already had a problem or came through a difficult time. And so the ones now you look at, if they made it through 2022, that means they didn't raise, and they didn't raise a big amount of money before that. That's a company that's going to crush it because they figured out how to do it without raising capital. And they did it with grit and determination, not giving up, which is, I would say, maybe half of the journey. Because if you give up, you guarantee failure. So you have to have a team that doesn't give up. And a lot of the times people just, they can't take it. They can't take the roller coaster. They can't take the lows and the down days and the rejection that is inevitable with, you know, startups. And so if you see a team that's sort of crossed over that and you can read between the lines, you're like, wow, they only raised a million. They made it through 2022. Now they're doing 3 million a year. This company with funding is going to be 12 million in two years because of the grit and the ability to be very, very efficient with capital. And those are the ones I sort of look for. And then I compare it and think about, okay, well, what are the competing solutions? How fast, you know, can they grow? Um, how sticky, you know, is the product itself? And, and um, do they have any real, you know, existing market competitors that they're disrupting, which, can be a faster way than trying to create a new product area, which is really, you know, which I found with personal experience was hard to do, you know, with media monitoring. It was like, nobody knew what media monitoring was and we're trying to sell media monitoring. So you're doing two sales at once. You're trying to right, educate. Right, right, right. That whole market, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, you can solve for those problems as you're, as you're looking at these companies. And so there's a bunch of different ones, you know, a few AI ones, there was one that was is a really interesting company and the names are escaping me all the time, but um, there was a company that's making this like, it's a new form of transportation over water. It's kind of a hybrid between a plane and a ferry. And it hovers, it's a plane, but it flies like only 50 feet above the ocean. 
and it can go, you know, six, seven, eight times faster than a ferry. And it's much more efficient because it's not plowing through waves and it's regulated as a boat instead of an airplane. So it avoids all the expensive regulations and they already have like a billion dollars in orders, you know, all around the Middle East to go back and forth, you know, across the Gulf and not have to, to waste a lot of time. So it's like the, the, the high speed train for water. And, uh, you know, then you look at who invested. And Lockheed Martin invested in the company. So then, you know, it's checking the box of like, okay, so you have a potential acquirer slash commercial partner who already yeah. put money in, you know, a team that's already built this before. Uh, you have, you know, letters of intent in hand, you know, from buyers. There's an obvious gain from the technology itself. You know, gasoline's going to get, you know, more and more expensive uh, conceivably over time and so forth. So those types of things you can kind of look at as a way to to gauge you know the potential success of the company, and there's been a couple that have you know doubled in value just in a year, and that we invested That's real in real value, not just inflated value because of capital brought in. Uh, well, you know, on a on a on a valuation basis from investors, yeah. So okay. paper gains, you know, where whatever the valuation was thirty million, we went in and it was sixty million at their Series B. And so you're like, okay, well, that was a, you know, a hundred percent increase in value in eight months. We'll see if that yeah. trajectory continues or not. <laughs> I always, uh, I, I, that my part of more, I love the fact that you um, talked about, you know, the grit to survive efficiency with capital, knowing the product market fit, you know, that was to me, what you just described as your takeaway when you're looking at, you know, those earlier stage deals that aren't, you know, a near exit where your money's going directly into helping the company, right? The competitive landscape, mm -hmm. who to buy, all of those kind of things. If they've had corporate funds, like in the case of um, this Lockheed one. Um, but the thing that I always advise entrepreneur or investors about is don't get caught up in the valuation game on a company that is their valuation is only based on the amount of money that's been put in. Right. That right. The unicorns. There's a lot of unicorns out there that should not be a unicorn. They're the WeWorks that have done a really good job yeah. of selling investors to continue to invest in them. They're the Theranoses out there that won't right. disclose their numbers, won't disclose their IP, won't disclose any of that kind of stuff. But they have a charismatic leader, you know, and so be careful. Don't get caught up in the the limiting effect of some investors and the mediocre rise of these companies really look because you don't want the snapchat when it goes to exit where there is no revenue model and right. it just implodes even though it's a billion dollar valuation right so right. um so that is uh is something that i think you know it's good on paper because it makes you feel good but it you look to be looking at a lot of the other fundamentals of of where they can go, what they can do with the additional capital that they may need, right? And so like in this particular, this case, these guys need some regular old debt financing and, mm -hmm. you know, but leveraged by the equity of the investors so that it's, they can get cash quicker than they could if they just were financing contracts. And right. so, and who they're financing the contracts for. So, you know, there's ways to, like, I always try you know, you can conserve your equity capital and then start to use debt to pay instead of, you know, the worst thing to do with equity capital is pay for things you can finance and to, you know, use it for the soft dollar things that, that you can't finance people, advertising, you know, R&D, things like that. Right. But leverage it. You know, that was the Silicon Valley Bank. Another one that went out would have been nice to anticipate that one. But that was the that originally was the model of Silicon Valley Bank for the venture capital people till right. they yeah, exactly. they over leverage themselves. So um, so that's, uh, you know, and I then, think that's fascinating that you're going in that. And I think it's really great to be looking at companies like that. I think that's going to be a takeaway from this podcast for the investors that are listening out there, because one of the things you get with Reg A plus is companies exactly at that stage that they may have gotten a small angel round, but they've now sustained through 
organic growth for X number of year, you know, years. So to angels and VCs, they're not really in the marketplace because they're not growing as rapidly as they had anticipated. But where do they go get money? They can't get it from VCs and private equity funds, you know, because they're not. Maybe they're a five million, three million dollar company, like you mentioned here. But they can go to the marketplace of of, of, of traditional retail investors as well as some of the investment bankers and pull it in. And I guess some, you know, investors like you that look for that company that's got the good meat and potatoes, but now is poised to really scale up if they got some capital and make a, make a difference happen. It's just, it's great that there's so many options out there for entrepreneurs to be able to raise capital, even if they are in that, what might not be hot and sizzly for the venture capital marketplace. It's it's always competitive to raise money. It's tough to get the VCs on board. They tend to, you know, follow each other. I mean, literally, it's called follow on capital for like ninety percent of the money because only ten percent makes the decision. Um, investors, you know, th those investors who put money into level fields, you know, I always point to how I look at my investments, which is by how much are you helping your customer. Are you incrementally saving them 5%, 10%? If so, eh, you know, it's going to be tough to get the customer to switch. But yeah. your orders of magnitude, right? If you're like, all right, well, for every three people, you know, th this technology, this robot, right? For example, invested this company that was doing automated drywall through robots. And they're huh. like, it can do the work of three people for an upfront investment of a one year salary and it does it with no workers comp <laughs> with no days off with no six days. And I was like, wow, that's pretty impressive. And so these big home builders are starting to roll out the robots just to do this drywall because it, there's a lot of repetitive stress injuries associated with that and large lawsuits. It's like, well, that's an easy, one, right? You know, a lot of, a lot of return uh, for, for the client. And it was the same when I was trying to convince investors to put money into level fields. I was like, look, our users come in at the entry level for $228 a year. If they use the system right, they should make that in about an hour off no. a trade. <laughs> <laughs> right? You could probably do a hundred times that using the platform if you follow it, you know, strategically what, what's laid out there. So in terms of benefit to the customer, it's an easy value proposition to explain. And therefore, you know, you kind of see it going to take off if the customer's happy. And I, and I saw it. In the previous business that we ran as well, where you know we would look at, well, what are you doing now, and how much does that cost, and and they would go, well, you know, Joe does this, and Ann does that, and we have five people doing it every morning, and they spend about two and a half hours on it, and we're like, okay, let's do the math on this. <laughs> you know? Do the math. How much do they get paid? Uh, you're forgetting overhead. You're forgetting, you know, insurance. You're forgetting this, and so we mathematically map it out. Like you're actually spending five hundred thousand dollars a year. You just don't know it. Wow. That's how much. That's how much you're doing. And then we'll give you a contract for a hundred thousand for it. And they went, huh? You know, I never looked at it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah, that is all such good information and. Um, I think that, you know, for the entrepreneurs that are listening that struggle sometimes or the ones that might be starting up, you know, savvy investors always want to know do, what's the product market fit and what is the pain that you're solving in the marketplace that makes people want to switch? Because there's always, you know this, but whenever you have a company that says there's no competition, they have not really understood their, they don't really understand their marketplace because you have the competition of the status quo of making them wanting to switch. They've saw right. people are always solving whatever problem they have in whatever way that they have. It could be, you know, like, I mean, even <laughs> not to age myself so much, but when IBM used to sell just typewriters and PCs came out, I was on a team that had to go and sell against IBM typewriters. Mm -hmm. And the way we sold against typewriters, our own products wasn't, was to the secretary and getting them to understand how they themselves hated to have to retype stuff, right? Because there was one <laughs> right. small change and they'd right. have to retype it. And they had other things they wanted to do. But then you go into the manager and you put that into the dollar numbers. And so this, 
you know, $3,000, whatever it was for a computer back then that was, you know, would save them, you know, same sort of thing. Right. And right. so whenever there's an evolution of technology, there's always the way they solved it. Right. And so I think mm -hmm. everybody listening that that piece doing the math is such a critical way for an entrepreneur to be able to to gain customers and for an investor to understand the value proposition of that company in the marketplace. And can they figure it out? And then I want to circle back around to a very thing you said a while back that I think is the premise of all investors, right? That that you have proven in this model that you say you look for companies that had survived 2020 into 2022. Is that old adage of a team, you're investing in the team and whatever product that they're doing, you know, the team will figure things out. And so a B product with an A team is, is a better investment than a B team with an A product. And, you know, I think with your knowledge of what you've done with Level Fields, your other company, and sort of understanding that has really, you know, been a benefit and to the, to the benefit of our listeners as something that, you know, to really think through, be patient when you're going about identifying opportunities and how you're going to do that. And, um, you know, but do put money into early stage companies that can take your dollars and directly apply it to growing a company and solving a problem in the marketplace. For sure. And I would, I would also look at where they came from on the team. Uh, and I would say there's a bias within the venture community to invest in teams where the people came from big companies, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, and they were head of product or head of whatever, and then you go to a startup. I do the exact opposite. I run away from that team okay, because they've been coddled with a huge yeah. budget, with a lot of staff. And the second the money runs out, they're all going to run for the hills and go get a job at another big company that throws a lot of money at them, that treats them nice, that they don't have to work so hard. That is such a true point. I learned that <laughs> lesson or learned that piece, got that piece of gold nugget from a guy here in town. You may have met him when you were running around, uh, you know, starting up, uh, oh my gov, Sig Mosley. He's kind of like the godfather of angel investing in the Atlanta market because he's been around forever and a day and has invested in a lot of companies that have begot other companies and stuff like that. And he told me he will always invest first in the 30 somethings that um, you know, may have been in a company for a little bit, but they've found a problem that they're solving because they're hungry and want to chart their own path of success versus the 50 year old executive in a company that's been in the corporate America all their life because they don't know how to do it if they don't have a secretary and this and that and the other thing because they have, they've gotten mm -hmm. used to that. And right. I got screwed by companies I invested or worked with that. I bought into the credentials rather than the hunger. Yeah. And, uh, and I, you know, learned that lesson the hard way. And then when Sig told me that I was like, that's so clear and here, you know, you yourself, you, that's, that's right. one of the things. So I would guess that's, that's kind of, that's a common thread of, of successful angel investing. It is, I think, you know, get into the psychology of it, right. You just look at the, where the person is in their life and you're like, are they going to have a spouse that really understands you know, going from kind of light, easy work to crazy hours, stressing about it all the time, worrying about your next funding round or your your product roadmap. And is that going to work out? Is that, you know, stress in the home going to end up putting stress on them to then leave and go back to a previous lifestyle that they were accustomed mm -hmm. to? Or is this person, a, you know, a serial entrepreneur that knows what it feels like and is not going to worry quite as much when things go kind of sour or they get tight financially because you just plow through. And instead of sitting there and going, Oh, woe is me. You pick up the phone and, and you, know, you make 30 phone calls and you make something happen. Yeah. 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 That's, uh, that's another, another golden nugget <laughs> out there on that because, um, you know, I, that all of that is just, I've seen it happen and, um, I think that's also very true and it's uh, great information that you've shared with our the audience and we've been chatting for a while. So I would like to offer up any closing remarks that you want to say, um, you know, as uh, we get ready to wrap up and I'll. 
So yeah, I'll happily do my my gratuitous plug <laughs> to go check out levelfields.ai. You know, we're an event-driven platform. We try to help individual investors get outsized returns in the market and identify those opportunities that you only see after the stock has moved 30%, 40% typically. We try to find them early and often. And even if that type of investing is not for you, it's, uh, it's the holidays. I'm sure there's a gift that you can make out of it for somebody. Yeah, there you go. There you go. And I'll wrap with uh, the point that you um, had made about uh, um, oh no, I just went blank on it. <laughs> but um, oh, darn. I had it. I should have written it down while I was sitting there. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, um, <laughs> so part of what I um, do as part of the Compassionate Capitalist Wealth Maximizing System, my training, is what you hit on that, you know, people will leave a corporate gig because everybody believes that they have a desire, they have an emotional desire to be an entrepreneur. They think that it would be so much fun to be an entrepreneur and they're bored with their corporate gig. They are not being challenged with it, all that kind of stuff. And I say now with all the options there are to invest in um, entrepreneurs, that when you invest in a young up and coming entrepreneur that is that is changing the way things are done, Robotics is an exciting area because it is without a doubt the wave of the future because of the labor cost issues, the the the, the scarcity of labor, people want to do, not wanting to do manual jobs like that anymore. Robotics is a great place to look. But I look at figuring out those things, listening to shows like this to figure out those things. You can get the passion of investing in an entrepreneur by sharing their passion, which is compassionate capitalism, and making money do it. And get to keep your your wife in or your spouse, not necessarily your wife, but keep by be able to keep doing all the fun things that you do in your corporate gig by taking off early on a Friday, being able to make it to all the family events, you know, being able to like go on the big vacations and get the best of both worlds by investing in entrepreneurs while you're a corporate executive and you know. And in the meantime, if you don't have the money to invest in entrepreneurs, go get levelfields.ai so that you can maximize your return on investment in your public stocks. You can find a next big win, and then you can get a little pool of cash for your 5% of your portfolio, as Andrew said, that you can then start looking at how to put those into other types of assets like private companies. So there's my plug. All right. Thank you. <laughs> well, it was a great, great, great <laughs> being on the show. Of us. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thanks so much. It was an awesome conversation. Nice to see you again as well, Karen. Yeah. All right. Onwards and upwards. Thank you for being on the show, Andrew. All right. Thank you.